Mate, love that. It is hype. The Bane is here, Ben Davis, mate. Good to see you on what an occasion to bring it together. UFC 300, dude. It's Special. insane. It's insane. Biggest pay-per-view in years. And, you know, what we see a lot is on paper, these fights, um, you know, should be great. But sometimes they fail to deliver. Correct me if I'm wrong, but UFC 300 nearly exceeded all the expectations people had. Yeah, man. I was saying knockout of the year. Uh, mm. One of the greatest knockouts I've ever seen. Rogan saying knockout of the century. <laughs> I don't think any hyperbole should be spared for this one. I'm going to chuck the headphones in. I think I got it. No, I, I concur with it, man. I mean, Max blessed Holloway taking out Justin Gaethje in that fashion. The context, the context of that fight. I would not be surprised if they wore that knockout of the year, decade, century. Fuck it. Why not? I mean, it was stupendous. And what a guy for it to have happened to. Max Holloway has been a staple of the UFC since what? He was 19 years old. One of um, the best Hawaiian fighters ever. I mean, it's, it's got to be what BJ Penn and then Holloway right there, potentially, maybe even eclipsing him uh, with that performance. So. It sucks for Gaethje fans. I'm an Arizonan, you know, born and raised in Phoenix. He's from State 48, so always hard to see your uh, <laughs> your fellow Arizonans get done like that. But, man, what a highlight. Dude, ridiculous. Uh, your voice has uh, been put yep. to good work, right? You've been a busy man. Respect. The last couple of years I've seen you blowing up. Uh, I, I was in the in-fight circus in Phuket we didn't get to chat uh this is the first time we're kind of speaking but uh tell me wow. a little bit about what you've been up to dude because you've been smashing it I appreciate that now it's been very busy you know um when I was a, a junior at ASU I was studying finance and promptly decided that I fucking hated finance and wanted to kind of pivot and sports is uh an interest of mine and, and mixed martial arts is my biggest passion. So I wanted to get involved in the industry and have just fallen into the play-by-play -play roles and positions. And I've been very blessed right now working um, two shows on UFC Fight Pass, Anthony Pettis FC and uh, Uriah Faber's A1 Combat. I do pro bowling work with Bull TV, uh, pro boxing with Misfits, KSI's, the influencer boxing, which I know the combat sports and the MMA crowd, we don't love influencer boxing, but it is fun um, and, uh, and kooky. And uh, the one last night was World Championship Sumo. So sumo wrestling play-by-play. -play. We did Madison Square Garden, which was crazy. 5,000 people came out uh, to the theater. And what a cool honor. I mean, I don't even have words to describe what it means to broadcast from the world's most famous arena. That's awesome. Uh, I've only been to MSG once. I was there for the original BMF fight between Diaz <laughs> and Masvidal. I was late for the event and I got out of the taxi and I walked straight into the Diaz entourage. We were walking to the arena, which was amazing. And then I couldn't get through because Trump was in the building. It was all happening on like a cold winter's yeah. night in New York. It was amazing. And now we've kind of come full circle. Third BMF fight. We said it was one and done. It wasn't. I don't mind a bit of spectacle. I don't mind a bit of drama when it comes to MMA. Um, we'll get into yeah. that. But I just want to ask you what your favorite gig is right now. What do you most enjoy? Oh, that's a really great question. It's almost an apples and oranges because they're all so different and unique, which is one of the reasons why I've diversified to keep things fresh. Like the way that I do play by play for pro bowling is vastly different from my play by play uh, for one of the UFC fight pass shows or MMA gigs. Like it just by definition, you know, my prep is completely different. The way that I'm, I'm calling it and emphasizing and accentuating moments is different. So I don't know if I could even compare, but like Dude, it's hard to beat sumo. Like, we had a really fantastic show last night. The pacing is incredible. You know, if you don't like PFL or UFC pacing, dude, tune into sumo. It's nothing but action. Um, and then the people are the nicest in the world. So, obviously, recency bias, uh, but I, I might have to lean towards sumo right now. Uh, talk to me quickly about Fight Circus, dude, because uh, <laughs> it's a special place in my heart. John, that's one of my best mates. What's your favorite Fight Circus event? Who's your favorite fighter? It's obviously got to be Blob Tang. He is the god of Fight Circus, and he proved that um, last time out, which I'm not sure if we even distributed the footage uh, from Fight Circus 9 yet, but when the fans see it, you're going to love Blob Tang even more. I really love um, two of the gimmicky fights that they have. The phone booth ones, where it's just two dudes in a literal fucking phone booth. I think that's a fantastic gimmick. Um, but the, the one that I really enjoy is when they put a tarp down and slick it up, and it's kind of like that that KY jelly boxing. Dude, I, the entertainment value is unmatched. 
hockey fights <laughs> yes the hockey We're, we call it the hockey fights now we called it something else in uh september penalty like, boxing I, I, yeah penalty box yeah it's it is dude it i've never laughed harder on a broadcast watching um dude, guys that, slipping that's, and falling that's what fight circus is all about for me i really enjoyed when they had a grab food driver fight a food panda driver for a motorbike in bare knuckle i don't know yeah. if they have grab or food panda in the u.s but whatever but my favorite event is the two versus one just because john nutt hosting the entire event, then wearing like a waistcoat and cartwheel kicking bank or no money and breaking his forearm in the opening move of the fight and then drinking Jack Daniels and then getting his rib messed up. Uh, it was just too much, dude. It was just like entertainment. Maybe uh, maybe we're sick, something wrong with us, but fight circus, you got to check it's it out. Uh, I wanted to ask you about that. I'd be remiss if I didn't, but now we've got to get into the action. First of all, though, are you experiencing an echo at all? Um, a little bit. Um, if I here, let me put my headphones on. Maybe that would assist with it. That might be it. Uh, meanwhile, as we get into the UFC 300 action, I invite anybody to comment, give us a question. We'll we'll address it. Um, big up Streamyard, man. I love I love I love the little the little the great UI. It's fantastic UI. Yeah, I love it. Man. Um, all right, so. Yeah, Max Holloway, back-to-back victories against the Korean Zombie and Justin Gaethje. I wanted to point that out because I was there for the zombie fight. And it was, I mean, zombie for me is kind of on a par with these guys. If he was a bit younger, I think he'd be in contention for like a BMF event. Absolute Mm -hmm. fan favorite. And um, it was just high drama, you know, knocking him out and then sending him off for retirement. And there was so much love between the two fighters in a way. And then to see him and Justin Gaethje, the build up to this fight, and then the way that it ended, we all knew that it was going to be violence. Gaethje just kept talking about violence. And right. Yeah. So he's the highlight reel. But the way that he broke his nose so early on, um, I think normal human beings watching that were thinking, well, I'd probably be looking for a way out right about now. And then he kind of had one. He got poked in the eye really badly. And then he got poked in his other eye really badly. And you're just thinking, man. Is there a worse guy on planet Earth that you could be fighting than a volume striker like Max Holloway? And <laughs> it landed some beautiful shots, and the fight just continued to evolve. It was stunning. And I think my favorite knockout of recent years was probably uh, Yaya Rodriguez against uh, Zombie, right? Last second of the fight, that elbow. This has topped it like by some distance. Uh, I, the spectacle is unbelievable. And like, you know, as much as I love the uh, Korean Zombie and Rodriguez fight, it, 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 it's not, I don't know if it's on par with as fun of a back and forth as Gaethje and uh, Holloway was. Admittedly, I'm c- comparing pound for pound uh, the action. But yeah, I mean, Holloway putting back, not, not just back to back knockouts, but walk off KOs where he's slumping guys. And I'm not going to call it a perfect retirement for a zombie because obviously perfect implies flawless and you know he did get knocked the fuck out but i think that was the most it was the most suiting end to his career he went out in a blaze of glory he brought the flames uh to holloway and just got scorched but against gaethje moving up a weight class trying to right the wrongs of ufc 236 against dustin poria for the interim lightweight title holloway did everything right he's so smart and um you know i, I saw some early opening lines against islam makachev um, and Holloway was lined as a, a pretty decent underdog. And I'd love to see that fight. I mean, Holloway just inserted himself right in the mix at 155. Yeah, this one was crazy, right? Because we've seen him at 155 before against Poirier. Uh, what was it? Muffin Top Max, they were calling him. That was <laughs> four weeks or something. It was. He didn't have a lot of time to go up to 55. This time he had time and he looked so natural. He looked bigger. He looked comfortable. And he was just not just the classic max that we all know and love and rate ever so highly, but spinning back kicks. Uh, I think I tweeted, dude, has he actually leveled up here? Uh, I think he's leveled (laughs) up. What do you think? I agree. You know, we talk about Max Holloway being 32 and he does have a lot of tread on tires, 13 years in the UFC of it, but maybe this guy's just entering his prime right now. I mean, we don't know. We're seeing new wrinkles and layers and just gamesmanship. Like there are, 
few people on the planet who would be cruising to a decision victory and 10 seconds to go point at the ground and say, Justin Gaethje, hardest hitter at 155, let me beckon you forward for a brawl and then knocking him out in such emphatic fashion like Max Holloway 101. And I want to mention, while he doesn't hold the belt anymore, Gaethje is absolutely a badass motherfucker like that dude is just in his DNA a BMF. He is. He is. Uh, I mean, one of everybody's favorite fighters, right? He's just so game. And it's one thing, right? One thing I have to ask you, right? If Max points to the ground again, is anybody going to indulge that? I know no, you, I wouldn't. I mean, no, no normal <laughs> human being would. They would just be like, no, thank you. Um, but I guess Ga- Gaethje, that just a man after his own heart. There's that love and respect. I think they said they should be friends now after this, right? Absolutely. You know, that's um, how you form the strongest relationships is by going toe to toe and then getting knocked out. Um, but yeah, you know, Gaethje, I think it's it's it was his it was his chance. And Max said that in the post fight press. He was like, I'm going to give him the opportunity. That's what a BMF does is last 10 seconds playing field is even 50 50 swing your best shot. Gaethje had the chance. Holloway just pulled the trigger quicker. Um, now it's curious where Justin Gaethje goes because a lot of people would have said, hey, this guy's next in line for a undisputed title shot if he just sat out a little bit more, right? That Dustin Poirier finish aged beautifully. But now it's kind of tough what to do with Gaethje. Maybe you run it with Mateusz Gamera potentially and, and get that fight going or Charles Oliveira too. What do you do with the highlight? Yeah, I think uh, Gamera was uh, was after that fight on Twitter, right? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Oliveira, Oliveira, okay. I think we're probably inevitably going to go back to Max at some point later because it's just so ridiculous. There's so many talking points, so many, many permutations. But did Oliveira really lose that fight? It, it was an interesting one. It was a split. And it's, I mean, if you're a massive uh, jujitsu head, I think you're looking at two near finishes and saying, surely he's done enough to win the fight. Personally, that axe kick was one of the best moments of the fight from Staruki. And flexibility, my word, uh, <laughs> it was special. And, uh, you know, damage, damage is important. Um, it was a fascinating yeah. fight, both those guys showing just how high level they are. Um, and Staruki, it- of course, he, he gave, uh, gave Mahachev a really good fight when they first met. So, you know. And they're on a collision course. I think Armin Saryukian, we've talked about him being the future of 155. He's clearly making it back to Islam. Uh, that's going to be a great rematch. But, you know, and, and I'll, I'll preface with this. Admittedly, I did not watch the fight again. Was broadcasting, only saw snippets. And uh, that's the question. The scoring criteria is evolving. Damage is now the big thing. And from a jiu-jitsu player's mindset, those are that's a damaging moment. It is nearly a finish. Um, but obviously some judges maybe don't see it that fashion. I don't know. I mean, I, I saw a general consensus that people felt Armin won, but they were happy with Charles's performance. I think a lot of people thought, oh, my God, Charles is going to get knocked out um, just like Benil did, but show that he's game. And while it is a split decision setback, Charles is, again, an inch away from the top. A look at Starukian's record. I mean, that's starting to look pretty handsome, right? He's got that loss against Gamrot, but, you know, that was back in, uh, when was that? You know, 22? Yeah, and, and uh, highly, highly contested, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, he is a beast. Uh, yeah, as I said, I think he gave Islam one of his toughest fights, and that was a while back. He's evolved since then. Look, anybody who beats Charles Oliveira, you're, you're up there with the very elite. Um, you know, what do you make of the uh, announcement of Poirier Islam? So I'll include the announcements of Costa and Sean Strickland and Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler in this same answer because I don't know why it was done at the post-fight presser, right? It's, you know, Dana coming in, getting a it's small... A zero shirt. ceremony, right? What was yeah, that? Just, it, it felt like an afterthought. It felt like, a, oh, here's some, some more schlop for you uh, to consume, whereas it could have been a really special moment during the event to, you know, platform and say, our biggest star ever... He's back, and we're announcing it um, at the middle of the, the biggest pay-per-view we've had in years. Same could be said for all of those other fights. I don't understand why you would do it at the post-fight presser. It, it kills the moment, like you said. And um, I don't know. I, I Some people were saying, oh, it would detract from the event. It would detract from the fights. I think that'd be a huge pop. I think the fans would go crazier about it as opposed to just sort of hearing, you know, they're, they're like walking out the door of UFC 300, and then over the shoulder they go, what, what was that? McGregor's back? What? 
you know, like we could have done that in a, in a better fashion, had some more uh, fanfare, but oh well, is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. And also uh, we've been made to wait and it's kind of, will they, won't they ever get it on? What do you make of the fact that uh, the weight <laughs> class, what is it, 175? I think 170. I think Aaron Bronstetter uh, had, had had a little typo on that. Welterweight limit for McGregor and Chandler. And listen, Connor's playing the veteran games here. He has extended Michael Chandler for years, <laughs> taking years of his career uh, to get the most optimal shot at beating, um, you know, one of the top ranked lightweights. I don't know. In terms of how the fight progresses, I feel Chandler gets it done fairly quickly and easily. Um, no disrespect to Connor McGregor, but we've had some skepticism about what his lifestyle is currently. Obviously, the Roadhouse principal photography and press tour, that takes you away from training. That takes you away from preparation meanwhile michael chandler is doing fucking you know 100 burpees by 7 a.m and continuing his just crossfit <laughs> type procedures and training so i don't know i i'm very comfortable with siding on michael chandler but the left hand of conor mcgregor is the big equalizer so who knows yeah 100 percent, and that that will still be with him i'm a hopelessly romantic when it comes to sport you know I, i've yeah. grown up on rocky movies i think we all have uh, we love a comeback story. I think people love to build people up, then they love to knock them down. You know, Connor being a prime example, he climbed to the very top of the sport, something that we'd never seen before. We'll all recall getting goosebump moments from the Aldo fights, the Alvarez, the Diaz fights. It was again and again, he created that Hollywood style drama in the UFC and in the sport of MMA. And then all of these outside of the octagon incidents happen. And invariably the fans the media they wanted to chop him down i think a lot of people relished his downfall against dustin poirier but now to see him come back everyone to a man to a woman is going to be watching this no matter whether you hate connor you love connor or even people's grandmothers are going to be tuning in for this because he is <laughs> connor mcgregor the numbers for roadhouse have been bananas i i, I need to watch the patrick swayze original i still haven't i hear it's an absolute classic i showed it to my wife and she was like this is your classic i think i think the kind of the 80s shtick was kind of lost on her patrick swayze is the man by the way um mm. yeah roadhouse it was it was kind of cheesy uh but you have to say the presence of connor on screen it's like everything that he does it's all about the presence of the man it's yeah. bigger than everything around him it just it's uh, it's it's magical, dude, and it's been rocking this promotion ever since he stepped foot inside that octagon. So when he's back, when we hear that Sinead O'Connor permeate the building, <laughs> it will fly through our screens from the US to Asia and back around the world. And who knows what's going to happen? I tell you what, Michael Chandler's an inspiration. What is he, 38 years old? He's older than me, man. Yeah. And he looks phenomenal. Uh, fair play to those burpees. Uh, who do you think is going to win that fight? Just uh, off the top of your head. I feel Chandler by KO. You know, he's got just as much explosive power. I think he has been training. He has been preparing. And Conor McGregor, the big question is, how is he going to look in a return? That was a devastating injury. And we've seen guys like Chris Weidman. We've seen guys like Anderson Silva rally from those types of compoundish fractures. Um, but again, Conor McGregor is not in a place in life where he is training consistently or I'm unaware of it. And I don't pretend to be privy to everything Conor's doing, right? Maybe he does have his Kavanaugh's and um, Owen Roddy's all around him during these filming sessions and press tours. Who knows? But I just feel like the guy that is a little bit locked in, right? Right now is Michael Chandler. Um, but like you said, Conor McGregor, his his presence and um, just demeanor is ridiculous. His absence has been felt. And I'll say this, like you mentioned, and this is a Pete Weber quote, one of the best bowlers of all time. Love him. Hate him. All you can do is watch him. And we will all be tuning in to the Notorious one. 100%. And um, there are fights out there that I still want to see. I was mm -hmm. really disappointed that we never got to see Masvidal McGregor in their peak because I think that yeah. would have broken all pay-per-view records. 2019 was the time to do it. Uh, Masvidal's rise, his renaissance, I found fascinating to watch. I think he disappeared for a while. He went on some reality TV show <laughs> and he came back and he beat, uh, yeah, I think he had no phones and he just said it, it was a reset for him and he, he rediscovered yeah. his greatness. And he knocked out Darren Till, then went on a tear, did the Askren thing and uh, it was phenomenal because he became a superstar. Uh, it's interesting, the Diaz fight, because when I spoke to Jorge, he said he could maybe do one more because his knuckles are, are a mess. But yeah, 
I think if the money's right, is it too late to do uh, to do McGregor Mass for that one day? I mean, they're both kind of in their mid late thirties, right? Mass a little bit older, like Connor's mid thirties now. But um, if it makes money, it makes sense, right? And there's so many tales in the fight business of fights that should have gone down and didn't go down. Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua being probably the main one, and now it's come around again. They could make that fight again. <laughs> um, uh, my point being, uh, there are still fights out there. I'd love to see McGregor, Charles Oliveira. I think that would be so much fun. And the one that's been talked about is Max Holloway, the rematch. Uh, now Max would go into it as the heavy favorite, but psychologically, it's always interesting when you have a win over somebody. Uh, I don't know. I think they could promote it in such a way that it could make you believe that Connor would win. The reality here is that he'd be a heavy underdog given his lack of activity and given where Max has gone to. But man, could they sell that fight right now? If if Connor beats Chandler, is the biggest fight to make Max Holloway. The good news is with Connor McGregor, you put him opposite in the cage um, of a, a, a Macintosh laptop, and he'll sell a million pay per views. Like the guy is just built for uh, you know this business. Him versus Holloway is a curious one, right? Because like you mentioned, it's a rematch. Connor has an existing victory, but sort of what we said with Armin Saryuki and, and the progression. Holloway is just I think light years ahead, and again, the activity, the competition, the strength, the schedule. Um, I think he'd kill Connor McGregor. But there's more to me. There's more interesting avenues for Holloway proceeding from this. Like I said, he's right in the conversation at lightweight for a title shot, potentially. Um, he is, owed, I don't want to say owed one, but a featherweight title shot against Ilya Teporia at the Barnabu uh, would be bonkers. I mean, that would be the biggest thing since sliced bread. Or you could do uh, Holloway versus anybody else. Like it, it just, I feel there's better ways to use Max Holloway right now um, than maybe a, a McGregor rematch. But yeah, if I had to pick who would win, Holloway by TKO. Yeah, the only thing I would say to that is Holloway's been there and done it, right? He's reigned and has a claim of being one of the best featherweights of all time. Yeah, I think you have to do the Tapuria fight, right? Because mm -hmm. it's massive and Tapuria is a very exciting star in terms of the numbers he's doing. But after that, and, you know, McGregor's busy. Uh, he's got his hands full. But maybe the next fight or the one after, you know, before yeah. you lose that window, maybe it has to be done. Uh, let's move on to the main event, yeah. dude. Uh, yeah. No, what, what were we going to say? Well, I was going to say, now that we've got the BMF belt around Holloway's waist, you have the opportunity to give Conor McGregor another championship. Um, so, like, that would be another reasoning why a Holloway rematch could make sense is, oh, we get to market Conor as a champion in the UFC once more if he wins that one. Well, there you go. And it'd be fun as well, you know, uh, there's always that Diaz trilogy as well. Uh, yeah. You know, Diaz having another crack at the BMF. There's so many ways you could. It must just be fun being Dana White, right? Because. Oh, um, yeah. Him, what you Shelby, do. Mick Maynard, best job in the world. Yeah, massively. Um, so main event. Um, were you surprised by the outcome? Uh, so. Alex Pereira. I was a little bit surprised, yes. Now, I goofed a little bit on Jamal because he goofed on me several months ago. So, no, uh, <laughs> no hate. Oh, yeah. It's all fun and games. Oh, yeah. all, all fun and games. But the, the thing with Jamal, and there's, oh, my God, just an excellent left hook and ground and pound, and it's game, set, match. Um now, the former light heavyweight champion, Jamal Hill, never lost the belt inside the cage, but some dubious circumstances that people felt when he even got the title. It was a Glover Teixeira coming off of a loss. It was a 42-year-old uh, Teixeira. So people didn't really love his reign, and then it ended very quickly because of the injury. And let's talk about that, an Achilles tear. That is a year-long process per uh, Tim Welch's surgeon. Tim went through the same situation, and Tim's surgeon said he, he, a year before you even get to the point where you can do strength and conditioning correctly, you can even train properly. This is nine months after. And we know that Jamal Hill outside of camp maybe doesn't stay in the best of shape. There's been times where, you know, like Patty, he's put on some weight. So you, you tack on the injury, you tack on some existing behavior outside of camp. And then, you know, you got to maybe contextualize the personal issues. He's having that domestic violence court case. That's got to be beyond stressful. I can't even imagine, um, you know, the ins and outs of how frustrating it is to deal with that, especially with a close family member. Um, and then you talk about short notice fight for Alex Padilla, one of the greatest strikers that we're going to be seeing. So everything was stacked up against Jamal. I, I, I believe that he had a huge amount of adversity. And then what happens? He breaks his fucking toe 
two weeks out. Like he didn't have enough going against him. So I don't know. It's tough. I really wanted him to come back, look good. He's got very powerful hands. His boxing is very crisp. Um, I think the footwork is a little bit maybe substandard at the elite level of 205, but he makes up for it in a lot of different ways. I was a little bit surprised at how easy Alex Padilla made it look. Um, But Jamal's young. He's going to bounce back. And I do believe he can be champion again. But yeah, that matchup is the one that I think many people are curious about. Yeah, Aspinall, uh, I feel like he has a lot of love from the fans. And then you have, of course, inevitably the the negative ones. This is MMA, after all, who are saying, what has he really done? He hasn't done enough, especially with the John Jones chat. He was getting a lot of that back from Jones, right? Saying, yeah. you don't even really deserve to be mentioning my name. But at the end of the day, Aspinall has has uh, progressed past all tasks put in front of him. And uh, right now, there's a chance for Pereira to make a special piece of history. Can you see anybody going through three divisions, winning three belts in the fashion that he's done, having just casually wandered across from the sport of kickboxing? <laughs> no, it's this crazy. I'm regional show. This is the UFC. Yeah, and he's only had 12 mixed martial arts fights, 12 pro MMA bouts. Um, and many of them, like I believe the, the chat mentioned earlier, many of them against former champions, many of them he's been knocking these guys out. So if he goes up to 265, Tommy Aspinall is there. And I, I want to address that real quickly, the John Jones comments, because I think in our day and age, media and people's um, opinions get twisted into the narrative and twisted into fact john jones saying oh you don't you haven't done anything to deserve me um you gotta get some more people john he's the interim fucking champion so if you want to be the undisputed you have to fight tom Aspinall, don't you that's how this fucking works so uh jones is i I gotta say i i am a little bit on the fence about john jones but tommy Aspinall is an elite guy now would i fight him at ufc 301 if i'm alex Pereira? no what i would do is i would single out a guy like a Tai Tuivasa or just like a fat heavyweight, knock him out, get a big win in Brazil. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No disrespect to Tai. I love the guy. You cannot call Tai Tuivasa a fat heavyweight, dude. Is he not? Is he not? Um, But I think Alex Pereira, (laughs) four-week turnaround would would be too quick for Tom Aspinall. Give Alex some time off and then give him a eight to 12 week camp for a shot at Tom. But if he wants to go to 265 and knock out one of the top 15, by all means, I'd love to see it in Brazil. He deserves it. And I think UFC 301 could use some poets on. Mm. There's so much fun the UFC could have. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation saying, oh, imagine if Connor is the surprise inclusion for UFC 300. <laughs> it just would never happen in a million years. You know, maybe in the WWE, like, oh my God, it's Connor's music. You know, <laughs> it would be fun from a viewing perspective, but just in terms of money to be made and fight promotion, it just would never happen. But uh, will this Portan in Brazil thing ever happen? Well, they've got three weeks to make it happen. Uh, it would be That's super cool. cool. Yeah, whatever. I mean, it, they haven't got much time. They've got enough time though. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the card is already, you know, the card is already there. Um, so... Surely they want to save such a blockbuster star for another event. But the the thing is, though, Alex is asking for it. You know, the champion is expressing, I want to be on that card. I want to fight in front of the hometown. If I'm the UFC, I honor that request. I make it happen. I make my big superstar happy by providing it. And the fans um, want to see it as well. So I think that the UFC has a great opportunity to service many different sides of this square. Um, It's just in terms of who they would put him up against. I just, I don't, I wouldn't do it against Tom Aspinall because that would be one, like you mentioned, that I'd want to build up, that I'd want to have, um, you know, a little bit of a, a <laughs> build for. And uh, yeah, Dana White roasts PFL. <laughs> oh man, I like PFL. They're, they're a great, great team. Fantastic group of people. Um, an interesting night on Friday with some production blips, but overall good show. enjoyed that. Uh, well, especially, you know, um, I've done my fair amount of commentary as well and we've all been there and I've done different levels of shows. I've definitely been to the bathroom and forgotten my mic was on uh, while I was peeing <laughs> and, um, and like, you know, probably talking shit about a dodgy promoter who was watching the stream. But, uh, you know, all fun yeah. and games. Um, uh, we've all had instances of hot mics. Oh, yeah. That, oh, at yeah. that level was intriguing. 
if I if every conversation I had with my color commentators was aired on a platform as big as ESPN, um, I probably would not be on ESPN. <laughs> you know, if all of those side conversations were, uh, you know, on the platform. Not saying they're anything crazy, but it's just that nature of this wasn't meant for the the broadcast right uh but you know that's that's pfl and uh i think that they're a really good product the bellator acquisition is is curious it's brought such a good roster in um so i don't know i mean you you fix up a couple small things and you got a really really solid product yeah absolutely um well i think just exciting to have as many promotions bringing good fights and bringing co good competition um it's interesting. So, so many facets of this industry, whether it's a gym or a fight camp or a promotion, it's kind of a bit of a with us, with us or against us mentality, but yeah. I just love fights and great stories and great fighters and great people. And so, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> leave it pretty open, you know, like, uh, I don't think you have to kind of just watch the UFC or just watch one or just watch the PFL. It's a great fight. It's a great fight. That's how yeah, I feel. watch it all. Am I a hippie? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not a hippie. I think that's that is the mature perspective. I think a lot of newer or, or fans that have just been introduced to MMA might stick with one product and be champions of that promotion and show and go, "This is my flag. I'm planting it on the UFC. I'm planting it on one championship." Uh, but I feel like the more you get involved in combat sports, either as a fan or on different sides of the industry, you just you grow an appreciation for fighting. And like one, the one uh, Friday fights where it's Muay Thai and it's four outs, like, dude, that that's insane. It's such good fights. Um, so I think with more time, people will grow to an appreciation of it all. But we do have a new age, a new wave of fans uh, that do fucking suck, I would say, in the UFC at times. Wow. So who knows? Yeah, man, you uh, you have a big platform. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, you, you're on, saying that if what you spoke about with your co-commentators went live on ESPN, you know, you wouldn't be on the broadcast. If you're willing to say on a live podcast that uh, the Taito Ivas is a fat heavyweight, what do you say in private? You have balls, my friend. You're an outspoken individual. Um, for better or worse, how baby, is for better Twitter, or worse. How, how is Twitter, like, how do you find being outspoken? How do you deal with all the nonsense? And also, if you tweeted this mm -hmm. out, we might get some comments. <laughs> I, I kind of was anticipating uh, I should have I should have retweeted or, or something to bring the crowd in. Um, no, Twitter's great. You know, I think social media is a very powerful tool and Twitter specifically unites a lot of people. It's so discussion based. It's so direct interaction with either fighters, fans, um, but you, you can't help but build relationships. Now, obviously, there's cons and there's trolls and people. Um, you know, will abuse it and kind of ruin it for everybody at times. But yeah, being outspoken and kind of having opinions and, and extreme opinions, I would uh, emphasize, is something that I've been trying to do for about three, four years now, ever since it started. Not intentionally, I mean, it's just who I am. But, you know, I had a conversation with Brandon Fitzgerald, who's a good buddy. And, um, you know, he was like, there's two roads you can go down. You can go down the fact guy where you're you're really just like a journalist and you're reporting and it's black and white and there's no color and there's no wrinkles and there's no layers. You can go down that route or you can go down the opinionated route. Both have pros and cons um, and they're both double-edged swords. But if you're a fact guy and you walk over to the opinion side, that's a line that you can no longer go back on, right? And I just, I know who I am. And um, so I was like, I'm not going to fucking pretend to be the fact guy <laughs> when, when at my core, I have opinions, I have takes. And, um, you know, in this day and age, that's what creates buzz and an intent and, and, and following. And, you know, a lot of my stuff is more memes and jokes. And I'm just I'm just trying to have fun. Some people get offended and irritated. And to those that like are genuinely upset or um, they're hurt by something I post, a joke, I apologize. It's not intended to uh, upset. I'm just trying to have fun and, uh, you know, post the best way I know how to. And on Twitter, that's just the platform I'm selected. So I like it, um, but I do get a ton of fucking hate from people. <laughs> the amount of DMs where it's like, you should kill yourself. I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> What's wrong oh, yeah. with people, man? Don't know. What's all I can you? control... All I can control is myself, you know, and at times, listen, I'm not going to pretend to be the most mature and holier than thou. Like I get irritated. I clap back me being petty with Jamal Hill and it's more a joke, but it, it's a little petty, right? Um, those are some things where, ugh, 
probably shouldn't, you know what I mean? Because let's say down the line, I want this gig. I want to work with this promotion. They're just going to look back and be like, hey, remember that time you fucking shit on Jamal Hill right after he got knocked out? Why would, you know, um, so they're, they're, that is a, an interesting thought. But yeah, people these days and uh, the fans, weird. But what what can you do? Yeah, it's a wild place out there, man. And, uh, but I do enjoy your content. It's super entertaining. It's funny. And uh, there's not many people that are that funny. Uh, there's a lot of weird people, though, I'd say, uh, in and around <laughs> MMA media, the internet, uh, you know, but it's all part of the, the game, the big circus of mixed martial arts. Uh, it makes it all yeah. interesting. It's never boring. I would say that. No. What do you think? it's always entertainment good bad or the other there is entertainment to be found uh on, on all facets of it and yeah the, i think the weird people is uh that's a big percentage <laughs> um, you know I, and i'll say this when i was younger i was a huge fan of like comic-con like i would get my daredevil outfit on and go and you know that demographic has attracted a lot of negative stereotypes and connotations so when i think about the mma fans and like how weird they are i think man, I've seen some weird people. <laughs> so I don't know if they're at that level yet, but in the vitriol and the toxicity, like one thing I really hate is when people um, will like DM a fighter. And this is, this isn't an original point. It's a reiteration, but when people are like, Oh, you cost me my parlay, you know, I gambled on you and you lost. Yeah. The fighter lost half his fucking no purse. One cares. Yeah, no, no, no one, one cares. No one cares. Like go home. <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah, you're going to have another event next week to bet on. Like why bitch? <laughs> but that is, that is wild to me that you can like, like how deluded is that? Like no one cares yeah. about that dude. Just uh, go home. <laughs> Don't cry about it. Um, Zhang Wei Li, Yan Xiao Nan. Uh, this was wild for a couple of reasons. I mean, the champ got knocked down twice, and uh, Yan. I saw Gary Tonin uh, make a video about this, and he was just saying, he, he basically insinuated that this may as well be let way. Um, what kind of a sport do we have where you can be out and uh, just be allowed to carry on? Um, I'm yeah. a, a bit of a sick bastards i was just like you know she's fine. <laughs> let's carry on but i don't know like uh isn't it i mean so much aggress aggressively savage things happen in mma i find it strange when people get precious about things of course like these are human beings we want them to all walk away healthily at the end of the day and maybe at times the sport goes too far uh in whichever yeah. promotion you watch there are instances where you look at it and you're like oh what am i watching yarn did look like she was out but at the same time you know, is that up, not up to her, her corner? Um, if, if, if they deem that to be too extreme to do something about it. That's a wonderful question. Um, and I think that there's not really one right answer. It's a, just a school of thought that you subscribe to. So if you're one of the believers in, um, you know, fight, fighter safety, which I am, I think fighter safety is the biggest priority in the world. Um, getting on top of those stoppages ahead of it and, and preserving the future, whether it be uh, years on the career, years on the life is vastly important. But many people, many fans would cite, hey, it's a championship out. This individual has worked their entire career to get to this point. The stakes could not be higher. They might not fight for this uh, title again. So, you know, and most fighters, if you ask them, they'd want to go out on the shield anyway. So Yan Zhao Nan, you know, getting, I, I saw I, this was one fight I didn't get to see. I'll, I'll have to watch it on my flight back. But, you know, she was subbed, TKO'd and then fought to the bell, which is ridiculous. Talk about toughness. Talk about durability. And like you mentioned, did knock down the champion. The power that she has is great. And it could set up a fantastic rematch in Shanghai or Beijing. And while it was pretty decisive, you know, Yan had her moments. So I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. T stopping fights ahead of time. I, it, it's so hard to say. I don't think there's a right answer. I would say that, um, you know, she fought to the bell. She's durable. She's one of the toughest straw weights on planet earth and props to her for that. Uh, cause if you stopped it early, then people would go, Oh, like Alex Perea and Yuri Prohaska. People wanted that fight to go a little bit longer because of the controversy. So decisiveness and championship bouts is important. Fighter safety is the utmost priority. So long answer long. I don't fucking know, man. <laughs> you didn't get to see the Bo Nickel fight. Uh, it was just another evolution in his journey to the top. I think he's only going one place. He oozes confidence. He levels yeah. up every time we see him. Cody Brundage was a really good test, a really interesting test for him. And ultimately, uh, Bo Nickel outclassed him. So interested to see who Bo Nickel fights next um yeah he's just he's just doing his thing right six and oh now is he uh he's 
he's, he's, six and he's on an inevitable climb. I'll yeah. fin- I think I'll finish his, um, like, I think the Chamayev conversation, that. you do, you absolutely do. And like what he's done with collegiate wrestling is, is deeply impressive as well. Like he could have not done mixed martial arts and been heralded as, you know, one of the top wrestlers, if not the top guy, right. Of all time. Um, now the fight with Brundage, right. I agree. Cody was a great step up and brought the challenge. I had the chance to speak with him a couple of weeks ahead of the fight and dude was locked in. Like he knew the assignment. He knew what, what Bo was going to bring. And that's the beauty of Nichols game plan is he's still able to execute. Even when you know what's coming, Bo enforces his will. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those fights where I think people were booing. If I recall in the arena, um, just what I heard online and people were f- frustrated at the placement on the card. Why is he on the main card? What is going on? Here's why and Luke Thomas uh, put this perfectly. This is a guy that's going to be fighting for championships. This is a guy that's going to be main eventing um, and, and a fixture of the UFC moving forward. Why not platform him on the main card and, and give him that spotlight? Because we know that he's going to be a commodity that we use frequently down the line. Instead of proving people like Yuri Rakic or the other champions that were below him, I understand it. I would have liked to see Prohaska on the main card. But it, 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 at the same time, does it fucking matter? They're on the UFC 300 event as is. Like Cody Garbrandt and Biggie yeah. was the first fight. Like, come on. Yeah, and also, you know, I was sitting there, had it on in the kitchen. The family sort of running around, and people have varying degree of interest in this from like my stepfather-in-law, who probably doesn't wonders what on earth is going on during the grappling exchanges, and then my five-year-old <laughs> daughter, who's like, oh, this is cool. Uh, but then suddenly I'm like, Yuri's fighting. Yuri's fighting. <laughs> I love that man. He's just one of the most interesting characters I've ever encountered in my life. I've been very fortunate enough to interview him since he was fighting with Ryzen. I tried to do a quick fire with him. There is no such thing as a Yuri perhaps a quick fire. He's just so thoughtful in everything that he says. And he's an absolute savage. I was worried about him because, you know, I, I don't mind saying that I was rooting for him. You know, I, I yeah. consider myself a, a real journalist. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, like, like I said, once you walk that line, you can't go back to the fact guy, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know, man. I'm not here to ruin people's lives. I'm here to just like tell fighters stories and try to create some fun content and commentate. That's it. <laughs> so he's getting leg kicked and I'm worried about my boy. <laughs> he's getting leg kicked uh, badly. And he just doesn't give a shit. He just, uh, well, he went, he went and produced this. What an absolute samurai. And I like how he addressed that at the end. I mean, I don't know the direct quote, but it was something along the lines of, yeah, look, I might not be a real samurai. I'm a guy from the Czech Republic. But these values and these, this ethos has changed my life. It's meant something to me. And everybody should have something like that in their life. Is more or less yeah. what he said. And that was cool. I, I thought that was awesome. Like, good for you, Yuri. And that... Photo of him stood outside the arena alone <laughs> and fans. And you know what UFC fans are like, too intimidated to go up to him and say hi. I love that. That's just Yuri yeah. to a T. I mean, I asked him once, what's what's with the woods, you know? Like, do you, so you're going out there in the woods, you really feel connected with your samurai values. And he's like, I'm not some kind of woods man, dude. I, I live near a city. I just go out there to train. I'm like, okay, okay. Okay, like you know, it's it like acting like he was some sort of uh, you know weird. Yeah, well, he is weird but in a good way, He's, in the best kind of way. But there he's also are so good at MMA. Yeah, I I am blown away every time he competes by the level, by the awkwardness and unorthodox um, openings that he's able to find. You just you, you can't train for a guy like that. You can bring in sparring partners, but you just can't replicate what you're going to bring. And the mentality is the big X factor. Like you touched on, that quote was moving. It was beautiful, um, and it, I think it 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 could it could connect with everybody. You don't have to be a samurai. I'm just a guy from the Czech Republic, but. I have subscribed myself to this school of thought and that's the empowerment that I've gained from it. There isn't some like deep power, some, you know, Kung Fu Panda type shit where, Hey, the secret is just you baby. That's all it is. And I love that. Um, now Rakic heart goes out to him. Cause man, what a difficult opponent and, blowing your knee out in May of 2022 against Jan Blahovich, having such an extended layoff. Um, I, I was very curious what version was going to come back, who we were going to see. Uh, and here's <laughs> Yuri outside the fucking, this is the I, night before the fight. What is he doing? This, this is how all encompassing 
Ben Davis's Twitter feed is. If you want to absorb that gold, a blend of humor and fact and entertainment, go follow Ben the Bane Davis. But uh, dude, <laughs> we got to do this again sometime. This is really fun, but we need comments next time. So I need you to tweet this out so that we get for sure. We'll it's get a lot happen. of hate. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but I love the fact that this dude who filmed this didn't get near Yuri. He's filming this from like <laughs> 50 meters away. Like, how intimidating an aura does Yuri have? Like, go up to yeah. him. Or so. I don't know. I don't know. I actually had that moment with. Oh, okay, fair enough. There he is. There you go. We did. <laughs> um, but I had that moment with Diego Sanchez once. I was with John Nutt in Vegas. And we saw Diego Sanchez and we're like, you want to say hi? Like, nope. He looks like he looks dialed into whatever weird things are going on with him. And I don't want to interrupt that. So I'm not going to go say hi. Um, I think some people have that aura about them where they're just intense. I, yeah. I would definitely say hi to Yuri, though, because I find him unbelievably fascinating. Um, uh, aside from Yuri, uh, wait. So if Pereira looks tied up, um, what do you do with Yuri next? It's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I think Yuri now 34 and one as a mixed martial artist. Let me yank up the rankings uh, real quick. Excuse me. 34 and for, one. Nah, dude, he's definitely not 34 and one. No. No, he's 30 totally wins not. four. 30, 30 wins four losses and one no contest. I believe. Um, yeah. That, I don't know. Maybe I mean, he Chimel went on a Hill. wild winning streak for a while there until Pereira. His win streak was glorious. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's maybe get that uh, ah, yeah, I Yuri's winning at streak. It. I mean, and the way he did it, uh, it was like round one, round one, round one. He was just <laughs> knocking fools out over in Japan. Uh, I love the fact that he came to prominence with Ryzen, became a champion in Ryzen uh, before coming to the UFC. Uh, you know, he yeah. really was doing it. Uh, and then he made quick work of his rise, you know, in the UFC. It was like emphatic finishes wasn't it it was volcanoes oh, yeah. and it was that epic reyes finish then uh that really memorable fight in singapore against glover where he won it at the death uh by submission and it's only really <laughs> alex who can you know alex can put away anybody at any given any given sunday or whatever you know i um, think this is this is his fifth man. fifth ufc fight i believe isn't that crazy he's such <laughs> a fan favorite yeah five fights in <laughs> yeah Oh man, uh, I really enjoy the video where he says, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to go down as one of the great uh, UFC videos from social media, surely. Yeah, um, but I, you bring what up if we miss in terms of headlines, anything, what, what, what? Uh, well, uh, what, what would you do next with Yuri? Jamal, um, Blahovic, where, where would you put him? Uh, Jamal and him, well, the I'm coming. He was talking to Jamal, right? Um, mm. He was coming for Jamal. So uh, it's got to be Jamal, right? Because only because Poitain is is wrapped up. Um, if you're Yiri, you could sit and wait. I don't think he's that kind of guy. No. Is he? Uh, I think he's a samurai. So if you put a fight in front of him, I think he takes it. It's a big fight. Um, and then it puts to bed because there's been back and forth between those guys. Ultimately, if you're Yuri, you want to show that you're better than Jamal Hill. If you're Jamal Hill, you want to immediately put right what just went down at UFC 300. Absolutely. And I think the thing with Jamal is when you analyze his UFC tenure, a lot of those guys aren't really shaking waves in the division. Johnny Walker, great win. Walker is obviously on a good win streak. Um, but, you know, the Jimmy Crutes, uh, the... Um, Oh gosh, now now I'm blanking. What a terrible time for my memory to go. Uh, but either way, you know, I feel Jamal Hill has some work to do within the top five, top ten, and frequency is the issue. And again, I, I don't believe he's fully healed now with the broken toe, three months uh, out from when the Achilles tear would have been fully healed. I don't know when we're going to see Jamal next, but I, I think Yuri would be a fantastic opponent. Now, the last uh, narrative I want to touch on for UFC 300, early prelims, Jim Miller trying to create something that is not going to be replicated. UFC 100, UFC 200, but runs into a brick wall of Bobby Green at UFC 300. What a bummer. I really wanted Jim to get it done. Yeah, uh, maximum respect, Jim Miller. What a legend. I think he got some love from Connor on Twitter as well. Uh, Bobby Green, though, he just keeps keeps coming back. You know, whenever he suffers any kind of <laughs> adversity or loss, he'll come and deliver something. And 
he's one of the funnest interviews i think in the game he's always interesting uh never a dull moment so big up bobby green king bobby king yep. green change his name to king you gotta love that uh one thing i want to talk about is uh kayla harrison's body my goodness my wow. goodness she is jacked she is unbelievably strong what a victory for her i mean holly holm was that was that ever going to go well for holly I think that it could have gone better. <laughs> you know, any time that you land seven strikes and just get completely dominated, uh, yeah, yeah, you look back and go, fuck, that was a good fight. But Kayla Harrison, her battle, in my opinion, was with the scale. You know, coming from the PFL's lightweight ranks, shedding 20 pounds, there were a lot of a lot of concerns. And I'd heard that the test cut went well, and I'd heard these things behind the scenes, but I hadn't seen evidence. I hadn't seen substance until this fight week where she cruises and makes weight. It looked a bit difficult, but she's a two-time gold medalist. Olympic mentalities, are they're wired different. Um, and I think she's going to be a champion. Like, who's going to stop her? What do you do? And Amanda Nunez's super fight would be fantastic um, if she chooses to come out of retirement. That'd be great. I mean, that you know, that, the greatest female mixed martial artist taking on a monster in Kayla Harrison. Sign me up for it. I love it. Yeah, that was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> There was a meme, I think it was a classic Killian Murphy meme of uh, him saying, you know, Ronda Rousey watching a judo star put one over on Holly Holm, uh, looking displeased. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. God, imagine if Ronda could come back for like a judo off with Kayla Harrison. I think that shit would probably sail. I think so, especially considering how undersized Ronda would probably be <laughs> against Kayla. Um, it would be one of those like hypotheticals, right? Prime for prime, Kayla versus Ronda at a weight class that suits both uh, would be deeply curious. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ronda, her comments on Holly Holm left a little bit to be desired, admittedly. Uh, and Holly kind of said this perfectly. She's like, yo, Ronda just doesn't want to admit that I was the better fighter that night. And yeah it's completely difficult to deny it. Like it would be much better in my opinion, how I view Rhonda, um, which is very positively, but I would view her even better if she was like, you know what, Holly got me that night. And some, some opponents have just been really tough tasks. I've always done my best, but you know, it is what it is. Instead of going, I'm the greatest, I'm the best. Cause it's, you're clearly not the most influential, right? The most, I, I would say the most influential female mixed martial artist, which she did for the sports ridiculous. You look at the pay-per-view sales, no female comes close to Ronda. Um, but in terms of like inside the cage, we saw you get beat. We saw you have tough nights, um, own it, be accountable. I had a tough night, got knocked the fuck out, was not the better man. Um, you know what I'm saying? It happens. Taylor would make Ronda unrecognizable. Cowzos, thank you for your comment. Uh, Right now? Yeah, probably. I think Kayla would make a lot of people unrecognizable. Chris Cyborg is gunning for that fight, right? Ooh. She wants that fight. Um, I don't know what the politics is like with her in the UFC, though, right now. Yeah, with Cyborg, especially the PFL, you know, Don Davis will come into scrums and sort of talk about how it's, you know, the, the, they're, it's evolving and the contract status is getting worked on. And then, like, Cyborg will immediately tweet out, we haven't talked, you know, I haven't fought in a year. And so there's, it seems like there's a bit of dissonance. Um, and they're, they're, they're both great. Don's great. Chris is great. And I really do hope that we can make some matchups happen. Larissa Pacheco and Chris Cyborg is a barn burner. If, if you know women's featherweight, that is the be one of the best fights on the planet that could be made but yeah cyborg versus kayla cyborg wants it kayla has spoken about it but because of the promotions i do think it would be challenging to get it done if it happens oh my god but i i don't know if we're gonna see it uh quick word on strickland versus costa that's a fun one right yes it's a fun one um you know Costa, he had Rob Whitaker dead to rights with that spinning, you know, heel kick to the dome. And I think that's the best version of Paolo that we've seen. At times, Paolo comes into fight weeks and looks like he maybe didn't train or prepare the best or take things as seriously as he should. Case in point, the Marvin Vittori fight where he said, fuck it, we're going to make it a light heavyweight bout. And everyone just had to comply with what Paolo Costa's agenda was. So if he's fighting a guy like Sean Strickland, we need to see more of that Robert Whitaker, uh, Paolo Costa. We need to see that guy. Um, and I think it's a very interesting matchup i i do favor sean a little bit in that but i wouldn't be shocked if power gets it done that's one where it's it's a bit of a coin flip and uh it's really hard to side with either guy yeah if power comes in sharp comes in hungry you just don't know i think i think he's got another gear to show us and as much as it's all fun and games and his tweet game is is always entertaining 
he's a competitor at heart. You don't get to do what he's done without being a competitor. And deep down, he'll be he'll be smarting from results not going his way. And he'll look at Sean Strickland and think that he can hurt him. So yeah. I'm ready for a spectacle. I'm always ready for a spectacle. <laughs> um, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you're the man. Glad that we could do this. Let's do it again. Uh, guys, thanks for joining. Uh, this will sit on the Low Kick MMA homepage with all the UFC 300 content. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, get in touch. We'll do this again sometime and uh, have a good one. All the best with the, the crazy schedule you've got, man. Enjoy <laughs> these days. These are glorious days. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate the time. Nice one.